It's been a few weeks now since I've released my initial impressions video of the Pow Kitty RGB30. That's, uh, that's this little boy right here. I don't know why I said it that way. So if you haven't seen the initial impressions video, I definitely recommend checking out some of that first and then coming back here. But either way, I'm going to recap a little bit of what I talked about in that video. So the Pow Kitty RGB30 is a handheld device from Pow Kitty. It retails for usually about $100 or so, somewhere give or take up in that area. It's got a 1x1 one one aspect ratio 720p screen, and it looks really nice. It's a really nice screen compared to lots of other handhelds in this price range that I've used. That 1 to 1 aspect ratio is going to make this ideal for Game Boy and Game Boy Color games as well as systems like Neo Geo Pocket Color and the Pico 8. So in the initial impressions video, I didn't get to try this thing out for as long as I wanted to, which is why I made it sort of a two-part video. And I just also wasn't super pleased with my initial impression, so I wanted to give this thing a fair shot because I heard it was pretty dang good when it released. This is a flawed device, but one that could be worth picking up for a certain type of person. It's capable of playing a ton of different systems. You've got NES, Super Nintendo, Game Boy, Game Boy Color, Game Boy Advance, but you've even got PS1, N64, Dreamcast, PSP and Nintendo DS. Yes, you can play Nintendo DS games on this thing. It's not ideal for every DS game because it's not a touchscreen, but there are plenty of good DS games out there that you don't really need the touchscreen for that you can still play on this device just fine. I am going to stick to the rule that I made for myself where I'm not going to verbalize every game that comes on these things just for legal purposes and fear of legal things. With that being said, as a reminder, everything you see here on screen is something that is included with this 128 gig version of the RGB30 that I received from Banggood.com. I haven't added any of my own ROMs, so all the games you see here are included. By the way, Banggood.com did send me this one, but I've already fulfilled my obligation with them with the previous video, so this video is not going to have anything really to do with Banggood other than the fact that they sent this to me for the previous video. It's not sponsored, I'm making it myself. I will have affiliate links in the description to help with the channel if you guys so choose to use those links for purchasing. I'm gonna have links from Banggood as well as other sources as well where you can get it at different prices. So after more time using this thing and testing it out, I gotta say, I like it. it certainly is a flawed device and it wasn't all sunshine and rainbows, but it is still a pretty solid device. If you saw my last video, you may see here that I changed the theme a bit. I didn't change the OS. I was initially planning to look into switching to Arc OS or something like that. There's also MinUI for this thing. But after looking into both of them and looking more into Jell OS and whatnot, I realized that I would rather stick with Jell OS just because I like it more. If anything, this thing may benefit from a fresh restart with two new SD cards and all that, but I don't have the funds to do that right now. I'm not going to do that. An issue with MinUI for this device is it sort of limits the systems that are available to use for it. It's a minimalistic interface and it is focused on retro games specifically. So if you're planning to play anything past PS1, which this thing can do, you're not going to be able to do that with MinUI. I do prefer the look of this theme over the theme that was stock out of the box. That theme was pretty cool at first, but to be honest, the art is kind of gaudy and the way that the names of the systems are laid out is a little confusing. So I think this looks much cleaner, just makes it everything very clear as to what it is you're going to be playing. Now, if there are any games for this thing that you want to add that aren't already included, it's pretty simple to do if you have a computer. If you don't have a computer, I don't know if there is a way you can do it without borrowing someone else's and making sure that they know what it is you're going to be downloading onto their computer. But if you do have a computer, it is pretty simple. You'll need a micro SD card reader. Simply power off the device all the way, and once it's off, remove the micro SD card with the games. That's going to be the second one on the right here. Pop that into your computer with the micro SD card card reader, and then you're going to look for the ROM folder for the specific system you're trying to add ROMs for. Depending on the version of the OS that you have here, you may need to look for an actual folder called ROMs and then access the ROMs folder for the specific system in there. Otherwise, they should be in the root folder of the SD card. And then it's as simple as dragging and dropping the ROM file into the correct folder. For obvious reasons, I can't tell you or show you where to get ROMs. That's something you'll need to look into yourself elsewhere outside of YouTube. But once you have it, it really isn't that complicated. And and for anybody wondering if you can trade Pokemon or battle Pokemon with another one of these devices, I don't believe that you can. I've looked into it a little bit because it's a question I get a lot on some of my other videos. And from what I can tell, it is maybe doable with certain other emulators, certain types of plugins or whatnot that are out there that I don't fully understand because I'm still new to this. RetroArch does have netplay and that's usually done for other multiplayer games, Pokemon, the whole link cable thing that comes into play with 
linking two Game Boys, that's different than emulating two controllers plugged into a Super Nintendo, for example. When you launch a game that you've already played and have a save state in, you have the option of starting new or loading straight into your save state, which I really like. In most games, you can click both thumbsticks to open the RetroArch menu to manage settings, use save states, load save states. You can also speed up the game by pressing the select button and R2. There's a handful of useful hotkeys like that even for saving and loading and whatnot. It's all found in the RetroArch settings and you could even customize them if you want to. These are pretty common in a lot of handhelds using RetroArch, but I get these questions a lot from people who are totally new to this and that's totally fine. And to exit those RetroArch games, you can just press start and select twice. Systems like PSP and DS, however, don't use RetroArch, so the buttons are a little bit different. PSP uses PPSSPP and Nintendo DS uses Drastic. And of course, Pico 8 is kind of its own thing. I haven't figured out how to get out of Pico 8 once I've started it other than restarting the console. As for N64, I honestly don't play N64 all that much. I did look a bit into getting rid of those simulated CRT grid lines that the N64 has on this thing out of the box, and I couldn't really find anything on how to fix that. I went into the settings, and honestly, I saw a lot of things that I just didn't know what they were, and so I kind of left it alone. Mostly, I have been using this thing for Game Boy Advance, Super Nintendo, and the Pico 8. Pico 8 is great. I actually just started testing that out in the last week or so, finally, and honestly, I think it's really worth paying the $15 for to get the license. If you don't know what Pico 8 is, it's like a fictional console that uses fictional cartridges. It's a program you can pay $15 for for the license, and you can use it on any device that is compatible with Pico 8. All you gotta do is pay the $15. It takes you to a page with your links for your downloads and whatnot, and you can download it onto your computer, or you can download the Raspberry Pi version, drag and drop the files into the Pico 8 folder for the RGB 30, and it just works. You have to have an online connection, so you have to connect to the Wi-Fi to use it. Then once you're connected, just go into Explore, and then go through the different games and whatnot, and it'll load different games that are featured, your favorites and whatnot, and there's a bunch of tiny little micro games that you can go in there and try out. And honestly, it's a lot of fun. I spend a lot of time just doing that, and I definitely recommend it. So let's get into some of the issues that I had. First, the D-pad. The D-pad has this weird kind of sticking issue, sort of a sensitivity thing. I was playing games like Pokemon and Dragon Quest Monsters. I would change direction, but just for like a half a second, it would stay in the other direction that I was previously pressing because maybe it's a sensitivity thing, but it was like, even though I moved my finger, the button would still kind of trigger the switch that would cause it to go in the direction it was going before until I fully pressed the other direction. Another issue is battery drain. This thing had a weird weird battery drain issue where the battery life was just fine for the first 50% or so and then when I would hit 50% it would just start to plummet. Like it was 50% and then it was 47 then 39 and then from there I looked away I looked back and it was 17 and I literally got video of the battery life ticking down as I wasn't even playing a game I was just in the menu. I did look into it and I heard this can be an issue with some RGB 30s not all of them and if you are experiencing that issue the best fix at least for now is to open the device unplug the battery for about 10 to 15 seconds plug it back in, close it up, and try it again. It's definitely not ideal, but at least it is sort of a workaround if you happen to be one of the unlucky few like myself who experiences the issue. The main downside is, is it's not just as simple as removing the four screws in the back and popping it open. The plastic case is also snapped together and you're gonna need some kind of pry tool or like a guitar pick or something to get it open, which is not fun, not easy, and I'm always afraid I'm gonna break it. I did not test out the battery fix for this thing simply because I just don't feel like opening this thing again. I already did in the first video for another issue I had, and honestly I'm not planning to keep using it for right now, I'm moving on to other systems that I'm going to be reviewing in future videos. If you yourself have experienced the battery drain issue and you tried that fix and it worked, let me know in the comments, I'm curious. Apparently there's also a charging issue with this thing where you have to use a USB-A to USB-C cable, like the one that comes with it, and not like a quick charging cable like a USB-C to USB-C that may come with like an Android phone or something. You're supposed to use like a low powered charger, like an old square iPhone charger or something and a simple USB-A to USB-C cable. Otherwise, the thing's just not gonna charge. Apparently, it's an issue with Pow Kitty devices in general. Some people don't like it, some people don't mind it. Another sort of gripe I guess I have with this thing is the comfort. I really like how this thing looks, and it isn't the most uncomfortable device. These small handhelds aren't comfortable to begin with, especially if they don't have like some type of ergonomic grip, but it's just a little bit too tall and a little bit too thick to be all that comfortable for a long time of use. At least in more action-heavy games where you might be using the thumbsticks, button mashing and whatnot, but if you're playing something a little bit more old school and simple, maybe something turn-based like Pokemon or another RPG of some kind, then usually it probably won't be too bad because you'll just have to use the D-pad and the face buttons. Then again, I am 87 years old and I have the arthritis in my wrists and actually I actually do have like strain issues with my wrists so that could be a factor. Either way, you don't want those issues so just 
be safe when using this thing. Personally, I think the Anbernic RG35XXH is a little bit more comfortable because it's just a little bit shorter vertically, so it just fits a little bit better and a little more snug in my hands. All in all, I would say that this is a great device if your main focus for emulation is something like Game Boy, Game Boy Color, Wonder Swan, or Pico 8 simply because of the one-to-one -one aspect ratio screen that those devices will all take full advantage of. If you're mostly looking to play something like Super Nintendo, PS1, N64, Game Boy Advance, and whatnot that don't use a one-to-one -one aspect ratio, you may want to look elsewhere. Obviously, older systems can use 4x3 pretty well on this device as well, but you do get 4x3 on devices like the RGB 35XXH, the Miu Mini Plus, and so on. It's not a bad device by any means. In fact, I'd say it's pretty great, but it is pretty dang flawed as well. So if these flaws are something that glare out to you and you just you, you look at this and you're like that sounds like a bit of a headache maybe consider picking up another device otherwise rg35 xxh review right here if you haven't seen it um yeah check that out that's one i would probably recommend over this for basically everything else and yeah thank you guys so much for watching again i'll have affiliate links in the description make sure you subscribe if you're new i've got a couple pretty exciting handhelds that I have already here with me that I'm gonna be working on in the next reviews for, as well as a pretty dang exciting one coming that is not here yet, so keep uh, keep your eye out for those. Do you like my new microphone? Picked it up for a heck of a deal. It's full price. <laughs>